All right, would you please open up your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, there are pew Bibles in front of you under the, the chairs. Um, if you remember last week, we started a, uh, a five-week series, stepping out of the, the book of Matthew for a brief little period, uh, to talk about relationships, and we're looking specifically uh, how each and every one of us have a way of sabotaging relationships. And so last week we talked about pride, and how pride is really our way of contending for God's supremacy. We want to be supreme. We want to be in control. And so it's a, it's a sneaky sin. It's a per pervasive sin that affects each and every one of us. No one is immune to pride. Not one of us. And if we're honest, it is much more prevalent than we even realize. It affects every moment of our lives one way or the other. It, it surfaces in us being argumentative. It surfaces when we get defensive or when we are stubborn. I know there's no stubborn people here. It's when we get easily angered or when we are being condescending to people or even, even when we are interrupting people. There's no interrupters here. I know that. So I'm pre preaching to the people outside the church, obviously, right? So it, it shows up. It, it is the root of fear. It is insecurity. It's all about comparisons. And it's, not, it's, it's even about not being open to criticism. Pride has a way of killing relationships. It irritates people. And something worse, God opposes the proud. So this week, we are going to be looking specifically at the next subject, the subject of anger. And I, I chose this to be second because it is probably the most common expression of our contention with God for supremacy. So, with that being said, would you please stand, if you are able, for the reading of God's word. We are going to be looking at James chapter 1, starting at verse 19, and just reading through verse 21. Before we read, let's pray for God's blessing. Our Father, we want to know a firm foundation so that we feel like our, because we feel so often that our feet, relationally, emotionally, and spiritually, are on sinking sand. We feel like it could give at any moment. So right now, we need you only to do what you can do. To open our ears and open our eyes to behold the wondrous things revealed in your word. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, sent from on high, would you make these things plain to us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of Christ speaks to us like this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. I'm starting at 16, just so you know. Is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And now our text. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person, how many people? Every person. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. This is the word, Lord. 
you may be seated. So let me uh, put this out up front. Let, let's first start talking about why we need this series. I know I talked about this last week, but here, here are s- some brief reasons why you need this series. First of all, it is because relationships were God's idea. He created relationships. He created, put Adam and Eve together in the garden, but not just Adam and Eve in the garden. God was also with them, and there was a beautiful harmony that was going on. So it is God's idea for relationships. Secondly, here's the next one. We all have relationships. I know that's obvious, but sometimes we forget it. We get so used to, oh, I'm with so-and-so. I mean, I'm here together, but every single one of us, whether it be work or home through relationships that way, through dating, engagement, whatever it is, we all have relationships. Thirdly, though, we also see that relationships provide a sort, they're a source of just great joy and tremendous pain. You can mark your life by those, those moments of, uh, of, of a special relationship that has just been birthed, and it's like, oh my gosh, your, your heart goes pitter-patter. And those other moments where your heart is just absolutely crushed and broken. And lastly, we all need to remember this, we all have blind spots. Every single one of us. It happened again this week. As I was driving down Route 30, I thought I looked into my mirror and looked carefully because in my head I remembered this sermon or last week's sermon about a blind spot. And I got honked at this time, not by a, a gentle lady who gave me a special sign of her love, but a, an older gentleman who was a little bit more gracious. But I have blind spots. So just as a reminder this morning, this sermon is for you, not for the person next to you. They individually have to process it themselves. This sermon is for who? Yes, you. This sermon is for me. And so uh, even as I was preparing, just so you know, so as we're talking about anger, as I was preparing this message, I was confronted by the fact that anger is probably one of the most obvious kind of expressions of a proud heart, of my proud heart. Uh, It surfaces when my desires collide with God's designs. All of a sudden, I get angry. I'm reminded that this anger that is really um, fighting against God's design, God's desires, this anger of mine really deserves the full displeasure and deep displeasure of God because that anger is actually sin. It it loudly screams to God with a, a raised fist, my kingdom come, my will be done. In my marriage, in my workplace, wherever I go, my kingdom come. It's nothing short of just rebellion. It's damning, and that is bad news. So we're going to get to the good news later, but I just want to put it out up in front that as I'm working through it, I'm going, man, this is heavy stuff because I am finding myself in my anger rebelling against God. And this rebellion not only is a rebellion against God, it it is something that I... I use to try to get what I want. It kills relationships, and it irritates people. And so James, as we look at the book of James, as a whole, James is about a kind of a real religion, a kind of belief that is matched by works. So James is saying, what happens in your heart is something that should find itself working out in how you live it out, how you speak, how what what you do with your your hands and your lives. And so verses 19 through 21 is, is in a broader section of Scripture that is talking about being doers of the Word, 
being doers of this word, and the connection between spiritual maturity and one's speech. And so James wants those who claim to know Christ to show that their faith is real. And he specifically wants it to show up in relationships. Did you notice it, uh, it, the command that is in found in verse 19 would not make sense if you were living on a deserted island? Did you notice that? Verse 19, let everyone... Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That command would not make sense if you were on a deserted island by yourself. So it is obviously, you need those first few words to understand that it is in the context of relationships that this takes place. He says, let every person, every person, there, there is not one person exempt this morning from this command. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He is speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ. He is offering something that they should take note of. He says, know this, know this. He is offering a wisdom and he is providing a clear application of this True faith is shown by your works kind of teaching. In other words, faith in Jesus, true faith in Jesus affects how you listen. It affects how you talk and it affects how you deal with our anger. So the word here for anger is orhi. In, in the Greek, and it, it, it means to seek revenge or to seek punishment. It can mean, a, it, it can be a sudden or an impulsive or an outward kind of anger, or normally it is a deep seated, slow burning kind of internal anger. An internal anger. There's another word for anger, it is. Thumos, and that word is associated with wrath, particularly, normally, with God's wrath. And it's important, and that's an outward expression of, of anger. So it's important to notice that there are two kinds of anger going on here. It is the earning slow crockpot until it manifests and just pops out. And there is just this external popping of anger. But James wants you to notice this, that anger is not the only problem. It's not just this anger thing. The Bible links anger with our communication. It connects how we talk. It connects how we listen to issues with anger. It, it connects those things. And the reason the Bible does this is because God knows that the most that most of our sinful communication springs from a heart that is angry. Some of you are going, I just had one of these conversations this last week. It sprung from that conversation was, ooh, I said some things that were not so pleasant and cannot be, you know, repeated in this lovely, pure congregation. Because they were really nasty. They were really mean. And God knows that most of our sinful communication springs from a heart that is angry. And the Bible has a number of warnings. Again, go through the book of Proverbs, and you are going to see uh, these warnings about anger and how we communicate. Listen to Proverbs. I'm just going to list them off quick. Proverbs 12, 16. A fool shows his arrogance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Proverbs 14, 17. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil desire device, devices is hated. Proverbs 14, 29, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly, foolishness. 
This is a familiar one. Proverbs 15.1. A, an a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. 15.18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Sounds like uh, the writer of Proverbs and James had something in common there, right? So do, do you know what the problem is with all of these verses? The, they're not new information to us. That's the problem. They're not new information. No one is going to be leaving today going, wow, I had no idea that anger was so destructive. No one is going to do that. All of us are going to go, duh. Everyone knows that it is better to be controlled than to be a hothead. It is better to be cautious than to be caustic with our words. It is better to be tolerant than intolerant of others. We all know that Proverbs 29 verse 22 is true. A hot-tempered man commits many sins. We all know this. Jerry Bridges gives, gives some additional uh, sins that are linked to, uh, to this, the, the root of sin. He talks about it in his book, Respectable Sins. Now, just so you know, there are no respectable sins, but the way that we treat them as, oh, it's okay. These are kind of respectable. It's understandable. He talks about frustration. Being angry at whatever or whomever is blocking or hindering our plan frustrated with you is connected to anger right or what about resentment internalizing anger by holding on to previous wounds or dwelling on mistreatment huh resentment or, or what about bitterness a, a feeling of ongoing animosity because of a real or a perceived wrong it's usually unexpressed, and it's polite. Or what about hostility? It, hostility is just an outward expression of an internal bitterness through uh, denigrating or hateful speech or actions. And it, it involves communicating disdain to another person. What about strife? It is just the open conflict or turmoil that is between people. That's quite the list right there. And th those are often lists, that list of sins is kind of the way that we say, oh, that, that's all right. I can understand your frustration. I can understand how you might be resentful towards that person. Oh, I can understand that bitterness. That's okay. That's all right. But so much of this, anger is at the root of them all. And God wants us to see how devastating, how devastating anger can be. And he talks about his desire to actually put it away. God takes it seriously. Listen to Ephesians chapter 4, would you? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. He didn't say put some of it away. He said, let all of it be put away from you, along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And yet our struggle with anger is not because we don't know that it's bad, we, we lose the battle with anger because of what we want or what we desire internally. So verse 20 gives us a heart-based, God-centered reason why anger is bad. And the reason why anger is bad is because my anger doesn't produce righteousness. It doesn't produce the righteousness that God requires. Now, James doesn't, 
when, when he is using the word righteousness, he is not using it in the same way the Apostle Paul is using righteousness. The Apostle Paul is using righteousness in a, a legal or forensic or a, a justified sense as how we stand before God. We are justified in Christ Jesus. We are made right. Rather, James is referring, referring to a kind of righteousness that is pleasing to God. Uh, the, the kind of actions and lifestyles and feelings and emotions that fit within God's plan. So anger is not effective in producing actions and attitudes that are pleasing to God. And there's at least two immediate kind of implications as I look at this uh, of what James probably had, had in mind. First of all, he is probably, it's, it's applying to those people who I'm sure no one is here in this group, who in their self-righteousness and their your self-deceived hearts justify, justify their anger because they think think it accomplishes God's goal. I'm justified in doing this because I think this accomplishes God's goal. And these people get God's justice. They are God's rod, whacking off people left and right with their anger. You know, they're the kind of people that say, well, the, uh, the end justifies my means. For example, maybe a, a parent may be sinfully angry against his or her children and justified because it led the children's, children to change their behaviors and just obey. I've been guilty of that. Somehow I just, I'm justified in it because it brought about the changes that I wanted, even though it was sinful in how I said it. But there's another group. Another implication, and this applies in a more general sense um, to the simple fact that anger doesn't produce behavior that is pleasing to God. Anger, my friends, does not exist alone. Never does anger just exist alone. Anger expresses itself in actions that are typically sinful. Now, some of you are going, hold on a second. What about my righteous anger? My righteous anger. Now, that's a good question because there certainly is that type of anger that is, is justified and that is not sinful. However, let me say that most of the anger in your life and my life is not righteous anger. So let's kind of, I kind of want you to put that over on the shelf, and, and we're not really addressing that, but I, I want you to be uh, really cautious, really wary of being self-deceived in this area, finding ways to justify your sinful anger. But let me kind of give you, uh, what does righteous anger mean? Involve. I'm going to give you a, a, three points. I F E. It involves the right issue. The right issue. Righteous anger responds to a real and actual sin. It responds to a sin that is objectively defined in God's word. That is, it has to be the right issue. If there is the sin of adultery and it has crushed, you, you can have a righteous anger against that sin of adultery. Because what? God hates adultery. But it also needs to be the right focus, right issue and right focus. Righteous anger focuses on God and his kingdom not me and my kingdom. This kind of anger is, is moved because of a God-centeredness and not a self-centered 
concern. This is for the glory of God. This is for the purity of the church. This is so that Christ would be exalted and not me. So we have the right issue, the right focus. And then lastly, all of them are extremely important, but then there's the right expression of righteous anger. Righteous anger remains in control. It's not all-consuming. It is not explosive. It is not self-despairing. It does not withdraw from people. It does not ignore people. It seeks justice. It rebukes those who are transgressing God's law. It confronts evil, and it calls for repentance with a heart of mercy and a hope that that person would be reclaimed. So there is such a thing as righteous anger, but we are far more, I am far more uh, familiar with sinful anger, if I could just be honest. And where does this sinful anger come from? We need to see that the decision, hear that word, that decision to get angry relates to a choice between God's righteousness and my desires. Anger begs the question, is being please, pleasing to God really important to me or not? It's an expression of my battle for, for supremacy with God. Uh, sinful anger manifests itself when, when my desires clash with God's desires. So this morning, when you came in, if you got yourself a bulletin, you should have received within the bulletin, if not, you could probably grab one on the way out, a little brief handout from Paul Tripp's book. And this book, I want to tell you, is phenomenal. Last week, I recommended and did not have it in front of you, in front of me, The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. Grab it, get it, Amazon, good book. Secondly, the next book I would recommend for, the, for those of you in any kind of ministry, which each and every one of us are in, is getting the book by Paul Tripp, called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hand. Phenomenal book. And this is just a, an excerpt from a few pages, and it talks about a progression, a progression from stage one of desire, ultimately to the end of punishing people. And it, it starts, each step along the way creates more and more and more emotion, more and more expectations. And if your desire is not met, you will need to decide who is running your life. Your desires or God's designs. Now, put this away for a little bit. Because I know some of you are going, well, I'm, I'm okay in all six of those. But you read that for another time, get the book. It's phenomenal. Anger is the fruit of desire. Anger is the fruit of demand. Anger is what we feel when our desires, our kingdom, is hindered. Therefore, you have to realize that Anger just doesn't happen. It doesn't come out of the clear blue. There is a thinking pattern, a, a desire pattern that is always running underneath everything. Something is causing this, this anger to come out. Angry people do not stop and think. Hmm, I should just get angry right now. They feel angry. They feel squeezed in a moment. Do you, have you felt that yourself? This is when you nod. When, when something happens and your desires, expectations haven't been met, you don't go, hmm, how should I feel right now? He stepped on my toes. He ruined my plan. I should be angry. No, in that moment, all of a sudden, there's a Mount Vesuvius, right? An explosion of feelings. 
They feel angry. And when you feel angry, you have got to ask yourself three questions. One, why am I angry in this moment? Don't just allow anger to simply exist. You've got to stop. It, it, its power lies in emotions and its lack of rational or biblical thinking. Then you have to ask, what is it that I want? Try to evaluate what is at the root of your anger. What is it that you really want in this moment? What, what are you being denied? And what loss are you experiencing? And then ask yourself this third question. And it might be revealing is, what is it that I love? Evaluate how your, your desires fits in with the righteousness that God produce. And how does your desires fit within God's supremacy? Does my desires for control, my desires for this, my desires for that, are they truly my first love? So what do we do when we are struggling with this anger, which kills relationships and irritates people. Well, from the beginning of the message, I, I said that I was confronted that anger is probably one of the most obvious kind of expressions of my proud heart. And if I could pull back and watch myself from, you know, kind of above of what's going on, it is often me raising a, a fist, whether I realize it or not, I'm in rebellion against God, and, and I really kind of a, have a hatred of mankind. But there's good news. That's the bad news, because that bad news is damning. The good news is this, and you need to remember this as we go over uh, kind of some practical things. We need to remember that God is actually jealous for angry people. You rarely want to be the target of jealousy because people will get hurt. But there is a kind of a, a stream of jealousy that is rare and beautiful. It says, you are mine, and I want you back. It's, it's a strategy for getting back, getting you back, not in reckless rage, but with a pursuing love that has your best interest at heart. And this, my friend, is God's jealous response to an angry person. In the book of James, in James chapter 4, verse 5, he says this, he yearns, God yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell within us. Who would have thought that the angry person would be hotly pursued by God, by the Holy One, who invites him or her out of slavery and into his, actually his, his kingdom of peace. That's how God, God is hotly pursuing you with his love. A jealous love of saying, I want you back. And no one can escape the need for God's mercy to forgive and the power to, to transform God is spectacularly unfair. He does not deal with us according to our sins, right? Thank God. And we need far more than help. We, we need a life. We have a life or death need within us. Every one of us. We need to be rescued from the domain of darkness. And we need to be transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And he has done it. Thanks be to God. He has done it. And because he has done it, done it, if you are humble before God, we talked about this last week when it comes to pride, if we are humble before God, if his mercy gets the final say in who you are, your identity, then your angers will be tempered by mercy and gratitude into something 
uncommonly good. When, when, when our anger is constrained by faith and love, anger considers and even pursues the welfare of others and the glory of God. So the beautiful thing is that you and I have, if we are in Christ Jesus, if we have received him as our Lord and Savior, he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit who indwells within us. And part of the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and, and self-control. And we can say, Lord, I, I, need, I need more of you. I'm asking for help here because I'm an angry, sinful person. So how do we move forward? Let me, let me just give you, how many do I have? Five, five ways of moving forward. One, recognize that your anger is usually, I should have underlined it, bolded it, and circled it, is usually sinful. One, one author from CCEF, I'll put the link out there, and from which I got a lot of my resources from this Council of Christian uh, Council, Council, Amanda, what is it, do you know? Council of Christian Counselors Education Foundation, something like that. CCEF, I'll put it out there later. The, one author said, perhaps 95% of anyone's anger is plain, old-fashioned sin, and we all know it. 95%. You need to learn to carefully and quickly evaluate if your anger is indeed righteous, and usually it will not be. And most of the times, when we do get angry, it is because of selfish reasons. We need to stop making excuses. We need to stop justifying it. We need to stop, listen church, we need to stop tolerating it. Dude, you're, you're angry. Why are you so angry? I, I'm here with you. I'm not going anywhere. What's going on? We need to stop condoning anger. Here's the second thing. After we recognize that it's sinful, we need to actually, yeah, we need to confess and repent that that anger is sinful. The pride is at the root of your anger, and there are few things better than severing pride than confession. Giving it a name and just saying, Lord, oh, I confess that that anger, that moment, those words, my heart is sinful and I confess. Lord, I am turning from that. Help me. You will never be free from your anger, my friends. You will never be free from your anger until you learn to confess. Without excuse, without justification, without saying, I wouldn't have been angry if you hadn't done. Because we are, you are angry because you are proud. Third, and maybe this is kind of a reformed thing. I don't think it is. Learn to trust in the sovereignty of God. We need to learn to live very practically under the, the supremacy of God in all things. We need to learn to give up our desire to control our lives. To be driving this ship of Paul Vroom to the glory of God. The, the problem with anger is actually our failure to trust God. That's actually the problem. We need to learn to live with a, a robust and a daily understanding that God is over all things. Here's the fourth one. Choose to love. 
First Peter 4, 8 says that love covers a multitude of sins. A multitude. We need to be the kind of people who can overlook the faults, the failures, the disappointments of other people. We need to just say, I, I'm with you, I understand, and I'm choosing not to mark this one against you. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says that uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. My goodness, if you would sit down at Laura and my dinner table and listen to some of our conversations, you would qu probably quickly learn that we are pretty darn good at records of wrong. And so are you. Is it true? It's true of every one of us. We keep a record of wrongs. So my encouragement is to replace your anger with love, which means more than a feeling. Overcome your bitterness and anger by becoming, actually becoming kind and tender-hearted. And there's even commands in Scripture to be hospitable. And that hospitality is not just towards the people that I like to hang out with and the people who don't wrong me. The command is to love one another and be hospitable. Welcome them into your home and your lives. And here's the last one. We need to be people who are developing a forgiving heart. We need to have the kind of hearts that are are eager, that are desirous to forgive. And that's not saying, I, okay, that's all right, we're done, kind of forgiveness. You know, not too quick, because sometimes there's process and stuff that's just got to be worked out. But we should be eager and longing. I want to forgive you. I, I, I want, when, when someone says, will you forgive me? You, you just want to go up there and hug them and love on them and tears flowing down because you go, you know what? This is how Christ forgave me. He gave his all. He, he gave his life, his blood, he, his body, he, his throne of glory to come down to be with sinful, broken people. And he forgave me, the chief of sinners. So you're asking me if I'll forgive you? The answer is, of course of course, and I, I won't do the record of wrong. I won't do the don't ever do that again kind of thing. Because it's still, that's still holding on to your, your kingdom, isn't it? Listen, friends, anger kills relationships. And if we are going to have relationships within our church and outside of our church, with our extended family that honor Jesus and display Him to a watching world, then we are, are, what we have to do is we have to learn afresh in new ways that God does resist. God does resist the proud. And He does give grace to the humble. And... We need to remember and learn afresh that an angry person does not produce the righteousness that God requires. So may we grow and no longer sabotage our relationships with this, this anger that we have, this animosity. Let's be like Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, on our own, we are completely, completely inadequate to do this on our own. We do not have the strength to be able to kill the anger and the pride that's in our heart. But thanks be to God, you have given us Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit meant to empower us 
to live holy, sanctified lives. God, I pray that even today, even in this moment, that you are working in our hearts, that you help us to recognize how much anger has a, a hook in our hearts and our words. And as we prepare to come to this table to feast on Christ and the gospel, Lord, may we in this moment recognize that there are broken relationships that have been caused by pride and anger. Lord, help us to be reconciled with one another as we are reconciled to you. Help us, Lord. Give us your heart. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this we pray in Jesus' name.